University. All right, that's good. It's another part from here. It's Sean Whelan, he's a professor there. Yeah. He's a prof there. And uh, he, he, uh, I think he teaches law. Ah, I got you. He used to come to Germany uh, with the exception of this year because the bloody pest. Yeah. Uh, but he, he used to come and stay in Munich for a month uh, with all kinds of people, with a judge uh, who came with his family. It was like the trap family, you know, they were all playing instruments. And they used to live in my flat, uh, which is uh, close to here. And uh, well, they came for years and he brought me this hat. Ah, I got you. That's great. All right, so let me, I'm recording now. Let me do an introduction. Uh, good afternoon, John. My name is Claudio, and this is Christian uh, from Santiago, Chile. Uh, let's make a formal introduction for our listener uh, from the studios in Fairfax City. We are very humble and grateful that John accepted our invitation to our show. The band was founded after John and the other, the other pet at the Amon Duel Art Commune in Munich. The commune consisted of mainly university students who formed a music group initially to, to fund the, the commune with everyone who lived there uh, could easily join uh, and play music and, and so on and so forth, whether they had the ability to, uh, to have any experience or ability to play music. John, welcome to the show, finally. Yeah, uh, you're welcome as well. Thanks for inviting me. So you are a radio station? Yeah, so I, we work in different, Christian work in one particular radio station and I work in, in another one. Uh -huh. uh, so so we, all station. the interviews we share it. So we, you, you will be broadcasting many places all over the world. Uh, it just tells me I got a new mail from you. Uh, it's probably a late, uh, a slow mail. Yeah, no, I have not said that. <laughs> And uh, your band is very popular in Latin America. Uh, Popol Vuh is very popular in Latin America as well. And I know some members from, currently member from the band are, are used to be with uh, Popol Vuh. So we, so you know, it's, Danny. It's, a, it's a double pressure for us. So you know Danny, you've talked to Danny? Uh, no. no. Yes, not the name. No. Danny yeah. is, uh, uh, plays guitars and drums on Popol Vuh. And he's the drummer of Amundul. Oh yeah, we wanna we wanna talk to we, we wanna talk to everybody. <laughs> what <Well>, is <laughs> not music? So, he's not, um, so John, no. um, he's telling he's, you something. I'm sorry. He's telling you something. Yeah, he's going to tell you something about Danny. No, I just said Danny is not in my house today, so uh, uh, I can arrange that uh, that you have a meeting with him, but he's not here today. Sorry. No, that's what we can we can do a follow up meeting. Oh, good. And then today, let's concentrate in a module, and then we do another one, and we talk about Pobo Uh So this has been a, a weird year for everybody, John, with the pandemic and the past. And uh, how is this affecting your your creativity? Uh, the, you mean uh, this year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you cannot do shows, you cannot go out that much. Yeah, we had. Uh, I mean, our. Uh, data was full. We, we were supposed to play Spain and Portugal, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, Hungary, uh, several English tours, and it's all cancelled. And well, uh, I'm in my flat now. At the moment, I set up a little studio for uh, film music. Um, but that's all we can do. We've got a total lockup at the moment. So we're not supposed to go on the street uh, un unless we go to, to see a doctor or something like that, but it's total lock up. And it's at the moment, it's pretty bad over here. But we hear the figures in America are even worse. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Here it's very complicated, so. Well, for, you know. Yeah, you've uh, got this funny president uh, who is not doing anything about it. That's right. Yeah, hopefully with the new president in a couple of weeks, things will change. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Uh, were you born in a, in a musical family and when did you start to play in music? Well, um, actually, the big thing in my family was my grandfather who, who used to run a factory, um, factory for 
products, uh, you know, flour and, and all that. He, he, he built machines that pack yeah. flour. So it's, uh, you've got these big mills uh, and you uh, put in flour at, at the roof and it goes through five stories and will come out in little packets uh, at the bottom. <laughs> but, and they always wanted me to be uh, the chief uh, director of the company when I'm grown up. And that's how I was educated. My father played a zither. You know what a zither is? It's a Bavarian yeah. instrument uh, that you play. It's a little bit like a guitar, but it's like a table, you know, with uh, lots of strings. Uh -huh. And you play it like that. You the sitar? No, no, it's a zither. How do you spell it? Uh, Z-I-T-H-E-R. Mm. And yeah. uh, it's a Bavarian instrument. That they play it in Bavaria. And my mother played uh, accordion, you know, uh, this um, big accordion. Uh, but we, we did lots of singing in the family, but we, did, we never played music. And I was actually, when I was 10 years old, I was sent to boarding school. And that's when my uh, musical sense actually woke up. And uh, unfortunately, my, my grandfather had to uh, do without me. Uh, I never, I worked in the, in the company as a child, but I never went to the factory uh, to be the boss. Uh, uh, I, he sold the company, I don't know what, what happened to it. Um, and when I was 12 or 13, I started playing uh, with some mates in the boarding school. Uh, the Beatles were coming up in those days and everybody was very excited about this new sound. And when I was 15, um, we had our, with a band called the Mercy Gents. It was a, a band in the, in the boarding school. Um, Mercy is the river going through Liverpool, you know, the Mercy Gents. And we were all on stage with black trousers, red shirts, black ties. Um, and actually we're quite successful. Um, there's, have you ever heard of Tony Sheridan's Big Six. Mm -hmm. Oh, come he, he used to play with the Beatles one day, and we had a competition against his Big Six with him, and we won with a song called "Girl" uh, from the Beatles um, in those days. When I was 18, 19, I left boarding school. I left the whole system. I left school. I left home, and we started the commune. And, uh, well, this was the beginning of Amandul. The commune is for people that don't know, is that it's like a community for artists? Uh, actually, it was different. Uh, no one thought of uh, music in those days. We, we, there were a few persons in the commune who had instruments, but it was actually getting away from the parents, uh, finding, uh, in those days, families started to get divorced and all this shit. And we had strong desire to be in a big family, you know, three, four generation family. So some guys came together uh, to live together and, and to uh, leave society and start something new, start new life. And all, everybody was student, all were students. And when the parents found out these people are not going uh, into university anymore, but they're doing, they're starting a new sort of uh, ideology, a new, new life. Uh, they stopped the checks uh, that uh, fed us. <laughs> and when the checks stopped, we had to do something. So the people who, who played instruments said, let's play, we'll make a band. No one ever thought of making a career or, or being successful or anything like that. Uh, but that's what happened. Uh, so that's how Amundul started. Uh, it, it was uh, called something different, uh, had different names and many names until it ended up uh, being Amundul. And we finally did our first album, Fellow Stay. How, how many people were in that, in that commune? Oh, that's... 100, 200? No. <laughs> 
Sometimes it was 20, sometimes it was seven, you know, it was fluctuating. It was uh, more or less, but it never was hundreds. Uh, yeah. We had, uh, in our best, in the beginning, it was a handful worth. And we had our first house. We, uh, it was impossible in Germany uh, to get uh, a house because we had long hair. And this, uh, you go, when you had long hair, you still got beaten up in uh, Germany. You know, it was really dangerous on the streets. Uh, it was the times of students' revolution. And we had to uh, move in, in parks, you know, many people together uh, so we could defend ourselves. And we were absolute outcasts, absolute uh, out of society, and no one would let us uh, rent a flat or, or a house or something like that. But we succeeded in our first house was a villa on a lake in a very posh um, surrounding. And actually we sent our art director with uh, his girlfriend. We sent them there and they pretended being a couple uh, wanting to hire the house and they got the contract and then we all moved in. <laughs> all right. <laughs> they didn't like it at all, especially when in summertime uh, it was uh, on the lake. When we went in, uh, into the lake and, and actually entered their boats, they, uh, all these neighborhoods, they had boats and all that. We had nothing. We had barely anything to eat. Uh, but we went out there on their boats, sunbaking, until they came and chased us away. Sure. And it was, uh, after a while they found out we are not beasts. We are no beastly Huns or something like that. So we are nice people. And uh, the aggravation uh, was turned down a little bit, but it was tough times uh, then. Uh, after a while, after a couple of years, we, we did tours from this house on and, and went uh, through Germany playing all kinds of gigs. Uh, after a while, uh, you know, the house was on the lake and the kitchen was not uh, very clean always, you know, in communes, one problem is the kitchen. And in fact, uh, we had rats under the house, oh. water rats, because uh, it was on the water side. And our roadie tried to uh, scare them out. Uh, he put petrol into the uh, rat holes and lit it and out came naked rats because their fur was <laughs> burnt, down, uh, burnt down but uh, we didn't like the fight and uh, so we thought either we clean the kitchen or we move uh, so we moved and that was a very good move we moved to a house uh, with all kinds of artists with sculptors painters uh, authors, uh, literature, and, and all kinds of people in a house with 28 rooms, a big house, and we all lived there. It took about three months when all the artists said, it's bloody impossible to live with musicians and moved out. And we had a beautiful 28 room house. And that was our base for many years then. <laughs> Well, what a story. Well, go ahead, Christos. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, uh, John, it's a pleasure and honor to greet you. First of all, I have to tell you very shortly that I had the chance to be the music director on a very special station here in Santiago, Chile, back oh, in the 90s. And uh, I used to play many bands from the German rock scene. And it was the first time ever in Chile that we could have a radio station where you would hear this music, not only a special, uh, one special show in a day for a couple of hours, but during all the whole day. So it's a special occasion to make the circle go around this time and talk to you finally, because I only play your music. So uh, I just wanted to ask you, I just uh, sent you the, the, the question on the chat. If you can see that, I was going to ask you if uh, I hear that crowd rock was invented by the Brit press as a way of mocking uh, German rockers or people making music in Germany. Is that the real story? Like a uh, well, crowd, what, like like a distinctive, I do not, but it, it was good in the end because it made you different not, in the no, end. No, no, we no. do not like this term. We hate this term and we don't want this term being used. 
if you want to use it, we'll have to stop the interview. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it, it was actually only, uh, we never did crowd rock. No one knows what this is. Some stupid asshole invented this and mentioned this. And since there was, uh, it, it was never mentioned in the last uh, millennium, in the last hundred, uh, uh, only from 2004 on, uh, it appeared in the internet. And especially some very stupid German journalists thought it'd be a nice idea to do it. Because uh, after the war, you know, uh, when Germany was the baddie and uh, uh, we started having uh, uh, products again and did export, we had to uh, write made in Germany on everything. So everybody knew that's from the baddies, don't buy it. And it was very successful in the end. So the German uh, journalists, and it was only two or three especially stupid people. Uh, they thought it might be a good idea to have crowd rock. Well, we were always psychedelic underground. Our friends were Frank Zappa, Pink Floyd, Velvet Underground, people like that. Uh, we, we were corresponding with them. Uh, we were playing with them on many, many festivals. Uh, we were friends. Uh, when Zappa was in, in Europe, he always called us up and we met uh, to see him after the concert, go somewhere or even see the concert and all that. And we were always psychedelic underground and many, many bands who are called crowd rock now and are dead already. I mean, they're all, while we talk about it, they're all rotating in their graves uh, out of horror. You know, it's a, a real uh, bad uh, expression. However, John, I, you know, I, ca I came familiar with the way of thinking of many musicians from the German scene by this uh, documentary that the BBC made called uh, Crowd Rock, The Rebirth of Germany, that I think is quite brilliant because it compiles different opinions from people from your band and several others. So it, it might have been a very bad idea to use uh, Crowd Rock, but at least uh, as a documentary, it lets you know and learn something more about German music that being in Chile is very difficult to know much more about that. Uh, it was difficult in the 70s, 80s and even today. Yeah, yeah, it was very, it was after the war, you know, our problem then was uh, we were in the middle of a bunch of Nazis because uh, yeah. uh, when after the war, uh, of course, they were they did something. The Allies did something which they call denazification. But what is this? Uh, the most important things like uh, teachers, uh, policemen, um, judges, you can't just switch them over. Uh, to educate people like that takes ages, takes years, seven, eight, nine, ten years. So our teachers, I, I'm um, born in 49, our teachers uh, had a very ten uh, slight tendency of being Nazis, some of them. So we were fighting Nazis all the time. This was one of the reasons uh, why we started the commune and said, we don't want to do with these uh, outrage Nazi heads. Um, we, we start a new society. We, we don't want all this. And yeah, uh, fortunately, uh, there was this vibration going through the planet, a cosmic vibration, uh, which had this worldwide youth revolution going on. And it was, in every country, it was, there was a different reason. As it was the Nazis in Germany, it was Vietnam in America. It was something else in France again, but it was the youth and uh, some uh, global youth movement started and was carried by the music. And we started uh, the music and we, uh, in Germany, you know, we have this Schlager sort of thing, this real uh, terrible music. Um, uh, and we, we hated it and didn't want to uh, do anything like that, but wanted to make music. So we uh, discovered music is communication, is total communication, and is free of values much more than language. And it's, it, it became our language. And 
uh, we started uh, our main thing. Uh, what even today I do best and most is improvising. And if you cultivate this uh, improvisation, it is total communication between musicians. Um, uh, I heard Carlos Santana one, one day uh, talk about it, and he knows about that because he said, oh, improvisation, that is uh, when musicians come together and you listen to the Holy Spirit. He understood what it is. My word for this very special um, uh, improvisation is ahal, A-H-A-L, ahal. Why is that? That's a word that I invented. This is the total spiritual communication between musicians, uh, a, a very high form of improvisation, aha. Because uh, jamming is not the right thing. Improvising is not the right, uh, it, it's not describing it uh, the right way. And uh, especially the English and some American people, they called it, um, it's the three minute song people, they call it uh, noodling. Because uh, they just uh, extend a riff and noodle it all the time. They, they didn't get the idea quite. Uh, but it is a very, uh, to me, it is the only thing uh, valid in music. You know, when I started music with 13 or 15, it was about the jigs. I started playing the guitar because of the jigs and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Later, you find out uh, there is something else in uh, music is doing something to you and uh, then music becomes more and more important. And very nice, we are uh, celebrating Beethoven today in uh, yeah. Germany. It is uh, 250th, not birthday, it's his christening. They don't know exactly when he was born. So uh, uh, everybody knows the symphonies, everybody knows the music that has been written down. Very few people know that Beethoven was actually going on tour and going on stage and he was improvising and people came to hear him improvise. He was uh, one of the big experts of improvisation. You know? uh, and yeah, it's great to hear that. Uh, it's the same, uh, it's the same uh, aim that we have, the same um, fun, the same desire, uh, the same spirit. Uh, why is there music? You know? it's, so it, it has uh, really made a big move in the 50 years from music for the chicks to music for God. All right. <laughs> so this takes us to my next question, John. How powerful uh, was music to move people and influence their behavior, their actions and ideology? Do you think it's changed in any way when you began with, uh, playing with Amandu? You think that people are, because technology has affected the way people uh, in the past, they would have to listen to the radio. Today, they make their own playlist and they are more independent. You know, everybody is depending on the cell phone. And uh, how much has changed the, the capacity of music to move people and to, to shape them in some way, ideologically, or I don't know, to shape their thoughts? You know what music I mean? Is, music is one of the most important uh, things in life of humans. Uh, through the centuries, through the millennia, it comes in all different uh, intensities, all different ways. Um, at the moment, it is more for the specialist music. Music is still moving, it's moving our emotions. It has uh, expressions that we don't have words for. So it is very important still for human beings to survive. Uh, but music is also the most abused uh, thing uh, in uh, human history. Uh, in the 70s, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, music had a, an impact on the development of people uh, in, a, in a way of uh, um, making more out of it, getting more understanding, uh, uh, um, self-completing uh, uh, something that is talking to your own innermost, to your individual inner, innermost, and you mustn't be told of anybody uh, what it means. Uh, it it uh, triggers an, a very special private meaning in every single individual. 
unfortunately, industry uh, is one of the big killers in this world. And industry, of course, also kills music. At the moment, the kind of music we see in television or in uh, most radios and commercial radios is really uh, some lipstick shit. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's just terrible. And it's doing nothing but formatting people uh, to a uh, mechanical format and just uh, be in, in, uh, in a mode of like or dislike instead of a moral or eth ethic mode. Especially, <clears throat> I, for instance, I only listen when I'm in my flat, I listen to classical music, uh, symphonies, uh, all, all uh, instrumental classical music, because um, it opens up so much. And um, at the moment, um, you know, in the 70s, it started in the 50s, uh, music was a, um, a trailer for something. It, it, it was transporting something. Um, it was communication between people, um, a long distance communication. Nowadays, it's rather um, terror. You know, it's, oh, you've got a cat. <laughs> I, I do. It's it a she cat. cat. Peter. Oh. Peter is her name. I love cats. In Kronwinkel, in our big 28 room house, we had 28 cats. Oh. That's too many. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's, uh, we had this uh, faint smell of a uh, zoo in, in the house. They fight. <laughs> sometimes they fight with each other. No, no, they were a big family. They only, oh, uh, when, when a, a, a foreign cat came in, a, strange, a stranger cat, mm. uh, they all uh, came together and chased her out. But the, <laughs> but the thing was, uh, we had one tomcat and all the others were females. So okay. they were not writing. <laughs> but back to the influence of music. The influence of music nowadays is to smooth, uh, to cool people, uh, to distract them uh, from the horror of our uh, civilization, which is actually not a civilization anymore. Uh, one of my new songs has a line, you're not civilized, you're just industrialized. And that's what we are. We are uh, there are so many industrial zombies and they rule us. Or even worse, I mean, when you look at the American president, it's just unbelievable that persons like that can be uh, in, in an office like that. I do not understand. And you see what's going on. We live at the end of a time, which means at the same time, a new time is starting. Back in the 70s, when we were in the commune and we, we tried to start uh, our new life, tried to find new ways of living, uh, real ways of living, honest ways of living, uh, we thought is a new time starting now. Uh, but all the creative people in uh, Europe uh, were, uh, when the business took over, uh, were unemployed, they were gone. Very different in America. They all in, are in, in Hollywood now. You know, all the creative people went to Hollywood. Uh, this is long time ago. At the moment, Hollywood is more uh, cultural aids uh, than uh, really something cultural. You know, we, I have the feeling it's, it's real. Only bang, 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 or <laughs> coming out of there. Uh, nothing else. Uh, the cuts, uh, the movies cut. Uh, are quicker and quicker and quicker just to puzzle people and and scare people yeah. and when you when you uh, when you're interested in spiritual uh, development uh, you know that fear is one of the worst things that you can have all the movies especially i always, uh, everybody says spielberg great director i think is one of the worst because he only works with fear there's always fear, fear all over, white shark, fear all over. Of course, you touch people with fear, it's an emotion, but it's a negative emotion. We need positive emotions. We need emotions that people uh, get the feeling of development, that they uh, try to develop their desires and not be afraid uh, all the time and uh, feel inferior. Uh, 
because the big uh, industry is uh, knocking their heads. Uh, mm. And when you look at, uh, I, I mentioned Trump the, uh, a minute ago, when you look at this ridiculous way of just lying all the time and just telling things uh, with the uh, idea, if you tell it, uh, if, if you say something often enough, people start believing it. It's terrible. It's, uh, where does it come from? It actually comes from the big companies. You can't, you can't enter a supermarket nowadays without being cheaters. You buy a packet and it's not in there what's written on it. Uh, there's less in it than they say. Uh, every, uh, every business is trying to cheat uh, the other one, make their profit by cheating everybody. What the fuck is this? I mean, what kind of life is this? We really have to stop this and do something else. We tried this in the 60s and 70s, but it was all bought by business. Every, uh, after a while, people went away from the communes and they said, God, I have to live, I have to earn money. And they got a good offer from some business uh, uh, thief and it all fell into pieces, fell into bits and pieces. So that's where we are. What are we going to do now? Uh, talking about John, talking about the the sound, the the, the search, and what you were doing uh, some years ago uh, versus today and today's reality. That's my next question. Does the original search and concept behind Amondu to doing your hey hey days, eighties, seventies, do you think it still resonates in today's circumstances? Uh, I mean, are you renewing the message? Are you adapting to today's reality? You just said your new song talks about specific things that were not happening in the past, obviously. Yeah, well, uh, I'm describing uh, where we went to and what happened, what uh, came out of the whole thing. Uh, but I'm not doing it with the uh, index finger saying, don't you do that and this is good and bad. Every time yeah. is as it is. And the times, good times, and then bad times, and good times and bad times is like a breath. The, the mankind is breathing. And at the moment we are breathing out. <laughs> and I hope uh, the time that we are breathing in again, and uh, so we get fed, you know, uh, breath yeah. is the second food. Uh, the first food we put in our stomach. The second food is uh, what we put in our lungs in our uh, blood uh, it, uh, it's, it, it makes the second body the astral body uh, and there is a third food as well uh, which we have to find out what it is uh, but uh, i'm waiting that mankind is breathing in again and feeding mankind ag again and well we'll be there uh, we haven't stopped the career because we like playing and we're still making music all the time uh, at, the, at the moment, it is very, very, very difficult because you're not allowed to come together and uh, make music. You know, we can't even, we're not even allowed to uh, celebrate Christmas. People uh, are told not, the families are told not to come together, not to meet uh, grandpa and grandma because you might infect them and they'll die. Are they doing this in America as well? Yeah, yes. Yeah. But I, 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 the problem is in, in South America, uh, John, is that people don't obey and they are, we are Latins and people in Latin America, you know, uh, you know, they love partying and they sometimes they, they are trying to uh, survive emotionally speaking because they've been like without breathing, without this confinement, you know, and people are without their jobs and uh some restaurants in the south of Chile are opening just the same. Some stores are opening just the same because they are revealing against the, the rules. Uh, they need to work. Otherwise, they yeah. do nothing. You know? we, got, we, we even got demonstrations here. Lots of yeah. people on the road saying, uh, stop it. And when you look at it, no one really knows what's going on in no way. First of all, the government doesn't know what this disease is all about. Uh, they don't know, they don't know uh, how it works. And they never had uh, the facilities uh, to stop it. Look at uh, the East. 
look at Asia. They're used to stuff like that. Uh, they had uh, masks from the beginning on and it's all not as bad there. Uh, when, uh, when it started in Germany, first they made a lockdown. Uh, so nothing, uh, it was not so bad because people didn't meet. Uh, and they said, you don't have to wear a mask. It, it, it doesn't help. Uh, but they said that because there were no masks. No, they had not, they were not prepared. Um, uh, no one till today, still today, still till today, no one knows what this disease is all about. Uh, why is it here? Uh, how to handle it? No one knows. And I think this is a worldwide thing. I believe uh, that this pest actually appears because humanity is treating the planet so badly. Yeah, absolutely. And the planet is reacting, you know. We had, we had the pests in the Middle Ages. It was the same thing. And uh, uh, people still uh, driving uh, uh, around with their uh, SUVs and polluting uh, the air, our food, our second food, polluting it, um, robbing the planet, exploiting the planet. And uh, they have, many people have not understood what this is all about. And they will see, uh, uh, economy is seeing it, economy is going down. Uh, yeah. If they make lockdowns, economy is going down. And we do not need the big companies anymore. We have to go into smaller things again. We have to uh, be uh, more humble. Uh, actually, when, you, when you're not supposed to leave home, uh, only when you have to buy something to eat, uh, life comes down to eating and shopping in uh, very little. And you realize there's so many things that you do not need at all. What you really need is contact with people and working together, helping each other and good food, good food for all three kinds of foods. But everything else that industry tells us that we have to have, that we need is not necessary, uh, but it's very, very hard to come down, you know. Uh, I think uh, the pest will actually force us to come down if we don't come to senses and uh, do the right thing ourselves. And we also, John, need to have more dialogue, more conversation and communication because that's gone. It's been gone for so long. Yeah. 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 Well, and real yeah. communication, not just plastic communication not spam communication, look at our uh, communication facilities, look at the internet, uh, look at all this spam shit. It's unbelievable. Oh. And uh, uh, there's always one behind you who is worse than the one that you just found out. And we have to control it, we have to uh, find control. Uh, now you can't uh, control it by telling people what to do. It's a matter of consciousness. We need more consciousness. And uh, I think this will influence the music as well, because uh, we, we have to, uh, there's no sense in uh, telling people, uh, you know, in my, uh, in my songs, I sometimes uh, have this revolution uh, hang up and say every, everything is gross, greedy, mindless. That's the, the age of being gross, greedy, mindless. And, uh, uh, it will be followed by something else or you're not civilized, you're just uh, industrialized, all these things. I think it, um, uh, uh, in my new songs, I will start to do it more on a positive way and not just make things uh, visible so everybody can see. Uh, you have to make it visible so people are not offended because we are all doing the wrong thing. There's no one who is Mr. Right. And Communication, as you said, is very important to find out what is the right thing, what can we do. You can't find out by yourself. This is another uh, lesson from, from these times now, from the last year, uh, that being by yourself is nothing. You're nothing. You're absolutely nothing. Yeah, well, before Claudio goes back uh, to the conversation, John, there's one more question about 
uh, drugs, if you don't mind my asking. They yeah. seem to have been part of most of the bands back in those days in the development of spontaneous, influential, and meaningful music that you were creating back in those days. Do you see this as a negative element these days? Like looking back, was it important? Was it how, how was it? Because I I, did, I really don't know. Because you yeah. have, for example, in the Cosmic Jokers, uh, you have uh, Klaus Schulz and uh, Manuel Getsching and those people playing supposedly under the influence of drugs and making these amazing experimental sessions um, being taped in the studio and they became classic. So I don't know how much uh, how much drugs did ha had to do in the whole process. Yeah, you know, uh, basically every culture has drugs involved. No. It, it, it was like that always. It only depends how you use them. When we were uh, in our teens and uh, breaking away from society, we realized we're all in jail. We're all in a prison. And we wanted to get out of this prison. I saw you try, first of all, you go away from places where you know from families, where you know this is prison, this is going nowhere. Um, then um, you're not successful. It's, it's not the solution to just run away. Then you find uh, you try drugs, uh, and uh, especially when I started, when we started uh, taking drugs, uh, the big thing was LSD, um, which was a new drug. In fact, when we took it the first times, it was still legal; it was not forbidden. And it's a very, very, very interesting drug. Um, I, I've seen many people die or go mad on LSD, yeah. but. Um, what it does, it takes away your ego completely. Um, we took drugs because we thought it's, it might be a way to get out of prison, of this prison, to, to break out. Uh, after a while, we found out it's not the solution. It, is, it was not the solution. It uh, cost many friends. It cost many um, bad uh, experiences. Uh, so. The next thing opening up was the spirit. And I think uh, that man is a self-developing mechanism. And you've got to find this out. True communication, you've got to find this out. That's when music helped us very much. Uh, this is more a solution. Uh, but you can uh, also in, in spiritual life, you can uh, get stuck. You can... Uh, be obsessed by some sects or whatever. Uh, everything can go in the right or in the wrong. So uh, we are, we cannot tell this is good, this is bad. Our parents, our teachers told us what's good and bad. We have to find out ourselves. And what is good for you might be bad for me. What's uh, bad, uh, good for me might be bad for you. Uh, everybody has to find out himself also. Uh, sometimes something is good, at another time it might be bad. It, it depends, you have to decide from moment to moment. Sometimes a drug is good, sometimes it's really bad for you. Did, did you ever make any records like under the influence of drugs? Sorry to ask, ask you this. Of course. You did? Okay. We played yeah. performances, I mean, uh, we had, uh, when, we, when we started, uh, being on, on stage, we had uh, weeks and months when we were on acid and uh, performing uh, all that. Uh, it was it was just there all the time. Um, yeah, um, you know you you know Yeti. Yeah. Yes, of course. On Yeti, there is a song called "Sandals in the Rain." Yeah. Do you understand? I, I kind of. Maybe you can Sandor, tell me more. Sandoz is a big Swiss company and they invented Hoffmann, the inventor of LSD, uh, sold uh, it to them. So Sandoz was selling very good LSD. And <laughs> Sandoz in the Rain. And it's the only title on this album when Amundul 2 and all the other uh, dual members that were there before all played on one song together. It's an improvisation, by the way. 
uh, the company Sandals sued us and said, oh, because they, because they, uh, I, I think they sussed what, what is going on. And they thought you doing this because of LSD. And of course uh, we won the process. Uh, we won the, the lawsuit because we told them, no, no, Sandals is just a sound creation uh, that we were using for a song and it's not to do with a company and we got away with it. But it, coming back to your question, you can make your own conclusions. <laughs> Good information, thank you. Hey, John, I was going back to uh, a little bit of the discography and a studio album. I noticed that the one you did one in 81, Vortex, then 95, uh, Nada, Moonshine, then 2010, uh, uh, Delirium. Nada, I, Moonshine I, is not an Amandul album. Huh? Nada, Moonshine is not an Amandul album. Oh, I'm sorry about that. So, why... yeah, they, they say it was, but it was actually, Nada, Moonshine was actually created by Chris and Lothar Maid. And oh, I... it was a terrible thing. Uh, I wasn't yeah. involved. Chris always wanted me to play on it and said, then we can call it an Amandul album. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, but it was yeah. made because everybody wanted an Amandul, the audience wanted an Amandul album. I so yeah. Lothar and Chris took the advantage. Yeah. So the question was, there was a lot of years in between the studio albums. So, right. Were you guys were more comfortable touring all the time than going back to the studio and, and recording new material? Or or there's some part, a specific reason? Why there's so many years in between albums? Uh, you know, um, at the moment, uh, we have negotiations with record companies. Yeah. And nowadays, is everything everything is different. You uh, do a, uh, your album in your stu own studio. You don't have uh, to use the studio of a record company. So it's all a bit different. Uh, only a side thing. Uh, they, up to... July 21, there will be releases of the best albums in, in bulks, you know, like uh, four or six albums at once. There will be releases from record companies. This only uh, side information. Uh, we are working on it now. Uh, one record company even offered uh, to produce a new album. Uh, a real album, real studio album, a real good one. Um, well, coming back to your question, uh, when we were in the commune, in the beginning of the commune, there were so and so many people, like 10 or 20 people coming together and everybody was self-sufficient. and every, Everybody had something and brought it along. Most people came with a car, so we had there were times we had 20 cars in the yard. Who bloody needs 20 cars, you know? Um, so living all the years in the commune, you do not have to take care of outer life so much because many things just happen by themselves when you so many people. There's always somebody cleaning up. There's always somebody paying the rent. There's always somebody uh, doing what is necessary you don't have to do everything yourself anymore. This creates a state, after a while, uh, the commune is like a very big tit. Everybody <laughs> sits on it and sucks. And no one takes care of uh, life anymore because you said, it's, it will be done anyway. People will do it, someone will do it. So after so many years, we all were very, uh, insufficient in living by ourselves and we had one moment uh, I remember uh, we had a gig in Berlin we played there and in those days we, we uh, drove a very big Cadillac Fleetwood long you know, it, it's a car it's about three times as long as a Volkswagen uh, it, uh, eight people could uh, sit in there or 12 people could sit in there comfortably. Uh, we freaked out Frank Zappa when we visited him in south of France uh, when we played in Antibes together with him. Uh, we came up with this 
giant uh, Cadillac. And when we uh, went into Nice to, to find look for his hotel, the streets became smaller and smaller and smaller. And all of a sudden, this big, big car couldn't go around the corners anymore. So all the French people looked out of the window and said, ah, stupid Bosch people from Germany. Mm. Uh, they don't even know they can't come in the streets with, with a big car like that. Then the doors opened and 12 long-haired beasts came out and carried the car around the corner and drove on. <laughs> we actually lifted the car and carried it yeah. around the corner because it couldn't be driven anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, we came, when we had this gig in Berlin, we came from Berlin uh, going to Munich and it was very, very silent in the car. In fact, all the journey, six hours or eight hours, no one spoke a single word because we had a discussion uh, before and days and weeks before and it, it accumulated uh, that we all were not self-sufficient anymore. We couldn't, we probably couldn't survive as single individuals anymore because we were so dependent on this commune. This was the big kid that fed us all. And everybody knew their a decision was uh, necessary. And actually we, we thought we have to split up the commune, see that everybody uh, becoming self-sufficient again, and then come back. And this was one of the reasons for the holes between the albums, because the Cadillac came into Munich, stopped, the doors opened, everybody took his bag and everybody went into a different direction. Weeks later, uh, we called each other up, oh, um, here I, I'm, I'm there, depression is over or whatever. But everybody had started to uh, get his own flat uh, to have a girl and get into a partnership with a girl or what is it's, it's been not the commune anymore and then it was all different you know uh, um, it was not like playing all together all the time and making an album every year it was being separate and it was it's very hard if something is split uh, to bring it back we've always been friends and always been uh, among duels uh, being together, but everybody had his own trip. For instance, I was going to Australia for a while, uh, for a, over a period of six years. Um, whenever it started being cold here, like September, October, I went into a plane and went to Sydney. And I stayed there uh, until June, half year, and came back in June to Munich. Summertime started. <laughs> And I did that over a period of six years. It means for uh, for a period of six years, I only had summers. <laughs> and uh, of course, we realized that uh, the Amundu thing was not just a career. It was uh, ne none of us ever thought of a career uh, of, of in the beginning of making a career. Uh, even now, I'm not thinking it is a career that uh, we had. It, it's our life. It was true life and it was uh, our desire to seek, to find something out, to go somewhere, uh, has been answered in a way. Uh, so everybody has experienced something. It's been our life and we cannot just split uh, now and do nothing. That's uh, uh, why we, we're still together. That's why we've been playing all the time. I mean, last year, we had uh, four gigs in Munich even, because uh, we didn't play in Munich for a long time. And we played Europe all the time, uh, all the years. And we're hoping very much that in 21, we can play again. No, absolutely, absolutely. yeah, definitely. Play again, but especially to be together again. I mean, to be, um, uh, we experience something uh, which you cannot share with anybody else, but people from the band. It is such an extreme lifestyle um, that it's very hard to share it with some somebody outside, you know. Now, nowadays that uh, you are, thank you very much for uh, your insight and for uh, with your answer. Um, 
nowadays when you're at home, what kind of music do you listen to? You mentioned classical music before. Well, I listen to classical music, but yeah. I do my own music, of course, all the time. I've got yeah. guitars all over the place. Yeah. And I've got, uh, at the moment, I, uh, I've got this set up. I set up this studio. Yeah. Uh, it's very, uh, nowadays, it's all much easier to set up a studio. I had a studio in my last place before I uh, was here. I'm in the city now again, in the middle of the city in Schwabing in Munich. And uh, uh, I had a studio, I had a house before and uh, I had a studio in there. And I've, uh, I had a practice room, which I lost this year because some asshole actually took over. And uh, it was just two minutes down the, down the road. You know, I could at any time, I could just go there and get a blow and uh, blow my ears uh, in my practice room. Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, got lost, but it's okay because at the moment we can't use this anyway. We couldn't use it because we're not allowed to uh, come together in a practice room and play. Uh, but I've got one or two possibilities uh, for a practice room for beginning of next year. And also I um, start, started the studio, uh, bought a few new machines, um, kept the best old machines. And I've got at least 30 or 50 really good songs. And I think three of them are top. They might uh, bang out. So you'll hear from yeah. us, definitely. And if yeah. you... If you're not hearing from Amundul, because uh, some died away, uh, percussionist Jan is married in Thailand now. He's in Munich at the moment, but his, his woman built him a house in Thailand. You know, the, the family, they are doing this and they're building houses for, for the guy. Uh, but then you will uh, look out for something called John von Dul. So that the new material, when, when is going to be released? And then you plan on touring in Europe and United States, Latin America, hopefully? Uh, we go there anytime, but uh, you know, we, the best, uh, the guys from Chicago, if they listen to your radio, hey, guys from Chicago, uh, they were the best, but uh, to go over to America costs a lot of money. Yeah. And uh, so we still waiting for an offer uh, so we can afford it, uh, but we'd love to play America. Uh, we're definitely going to play England. I've got so many offers from England. Uh, going to play England again. And while well, the rest of Europe, we, we're, we've been on all the festivals in uh, Europe. Actually, a couple of years ago, we played uh, Nice. No, not Nice. Uh, um, a big festival in a French city. Uh, and there was the saxophone player uh, of Elvis. Really? Uh, what was his name? Matthew, uh, Matthew Parker. Isn't it Matthew Parker? Uh, no, I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, it's, it's the sax player. He played uh, Elvis uh, on Elvis uh, on all the records. Oh. And mm -hmm. the funny thing was in the elevator, you know, there were 20 bands in, the, in town uh, and uh, in our hotel were uh, five or seven bands. The pool was uh, 24 hours open. The food uh, usually closed at five o'clock in the uh, afternoon. It was 24 hours open when they realized the musicians are hungry all the time. It, we had a ball there. It was really great. And uh, at one occasion, I went into the elevator and there were two black uh, guys, obviously musicians, and I said, you playing the festival as well? Oh yeah, oh yeah, we play the festival. Uh, and I said, uh, what's, what's your name? And he said, uh, Matthew Parker. <laughs> and I didn't know that it's, it's the sax player, it's Elvis sax player. And I said, uh, no, uh, who is this? And then he said in a French fashion, Mathieu Parker. And I still didn't understand. <laughs> And uh, then, then we found out who we are, and it was really fantastic. So yeah, in Portugal, there's a, an English guy who's uh, having an annual festival in Portugal. 
um, in port near Porto. We played all of it. We played Sweden. Uh, it, it was all fantastic. And we, I hope we can do it next year again when the bloody plague is going away. Christian, we'd like to see you in, uh, in South America. You need to go back to Chile. Argentina. Oh, anytime, anytime, as soon Brazil. as Brazil. Yeah, there, there is a, there's a little sect in, in Brazil. Yeah. And they are uh, what a, a very strange email. Uh, uh, it's got, I think there's a bit uh, Nazi vibration there. And they, oh. really, they really groove on uh, Deutsch Nepal. You know Deutsch Nepal? The song? No. The song Deutsch yeah. Nepal? Yeah. 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 And they really love Deutsch Nepal because uh, it's based on the, uh, you know, one day when we were very, very stoned uh, in Germany, we had this idea, man, what would have happened if Hitler would have won? And we were all mm -hmm. pale and shocked. Oh, shit. Uh, we, we, we had to, we would have go away very far, very far. And I, I said, yeah, we go to England. No, no, further away. Greece, no, no, further. Uh, Egypt, further away. Nepal, we go to Nepal because it's on the other side of the planet. Yeah. Uh, in those days, there was no internet and nothing. Uh, when we had this uh, stoned idea, I said, <laughs> Nepal. Hitler never comes to Nepal, so we, we'd be safe there. And we start Deutsch Nepal. So he so he thinks there is a German colony and he will never come because he will not come to conquer because I think because he thinks uh, Germans are there already. That was the original idea of playing Deutsch Nepal, of inventing Deutsch Nepal. You know? And there's this uh, little uh, community in Brazil um, and they are, the internet tells that there was something the spiritual, there's a spiritual part of the Nazis, so-called spiritual part of the Nazis, uh, Ahnenerbe, it's called Ahnenerbe, and this is in there, Ahnen is ancestors and Erbe is inherited, Ahnenerbe, this uh, was this section in, in Hitler's uh, uh, Reich, uh, and they were looking for the weird stuff, for the spiritual stuff, or for reading thoughts and all that, they had no idea about it, but they called it Ahnenerbe, and there's this a uh, little village or whatever. Uh, I think the father is one of the, is a bit brown and they've got this email and there's Ahnenerbe in the email. A-H-N-E-N Ahnenerbe Ahnenerbe and they are real fans. Really? In Brazil. Yeah. Well, you have many fans here too, so I hope you do come one day. Uh, uh, oh. To be honest, yeah, when, just call us. We'll be, we'll be there. <laughs> we, we will. Yeah, we'll do so. Now, I really, to be honest, I never do this, but I have, I don't know how much time, how much more time you have, but I have like uh, three or four topics I'd like to cover with you. And I'm just going to, just what I'm going to do now, there, there you are, like, uh, sorry, I'm going to send it again because I just sent them to Claudia. I have like four questions that maybe you want to answer like uh, briefly or whatever but they are very important questions for me. The first one is, uh, what was it like working with people of uh, like back in the heyday of, you know, in the 70s and 80s, were you a big community of musicians? Was this a competitive attitude? Because you were with people from, you know, Popol Who, you know that, we know as well. Did you all share experience in Germany? How was it like, uh, because uh, I have no idea really. Uh, yeah, those days, uh, people still were together. Uh, they were uh, working together. It's my phone, sorry. Uh, yeah. They were working. They were working together. They were uh, helping each other. I remember a big festival, the, the first big uh, festival, the Essen Song Days in Essen. Uh, there was Taste, Zappa, Pink Floyd, The Nice. Everybody was there. Fleetwood Mac. Everybody was there. And I remember in those days, uh, they all had WEM uh, PA systems. And in the afternoon, the roadies, all the roadies of all the bands were putting together all the PAs and making one huge, giant, big PA system. Mm -hmm. And everybody was singing and, ah, oh, Fleetwood Mac, best band in the world, Amundul, best band in the world. Everybody was together. 
and they were uh, creating something big. Nowadays, when we, especially this was actually carried in from America, when you uh, are a backing band of an American group, uh, you're not supposed to use their PA system uh, or maybe 10% of it, but you're not getting, they are not working together anymore. In the 70s, uh, the 80s were the beginning of the end. The 80s were, uh, in my, in my uh, view, the worst uh, decade of the last century. The 80s was just lipstick and bullshit. Uh, it was really terrible. Uh, but before that, 60s, 70s, I'm so proud I, I was there. Uh, there was something was going through this planet and not just in music. Uh, the other day, I, I found a book from the 70s from Krishna Murti. I don't know, have you ever heard of Krishna Murti? Just the name, yeah. It's an Indian uh, guy um, and the book came out in the 70s. And when you read it, all this vibration is there all of a sudden. You do not have books like that today. Today it's about superficial entertainment, not about seeking. Uh, there are no seekers around anymore uh, or the seekers there are, they are all uh, connected uh, inside privately and not publicly anymore. I remember a guy called Rejad Field. Uh, he's a, a Sufi dervish. Uh, in, I think it was in the, in the 80s, uh, we had articles about um, uh, Muslims being uh, bad or uh, uh, bad influence and uh, all this terror shit that started. And he, uh, he had a, a chalet in Zurich and he closed it down immediately and said, who needs advertising? And they all went into the underground, went back into the underground. I think all the seekers, you'll find them in the underground. And that's also why I don't like um, uh, this terrible expression, uh, the K word, uh, it's underground. Uh, look for the underground, look in the underground. Uh, Amundul was in the overground for a little while, but then went back into the underground. And that's our destination. That's what we, uh, what we do, but we are alive and kicking uh, until we die. Now, uh, John, how do you, ha had, you not, had you not been a musician, how could you possibly picture yourself during the last past 50 years or so? What else do you think you could have done? What other way could you have taken back in those days? I think I could have done anything, uh, anything of interest, but uh, it wasn't like that. I, I became a musician and my family was disgusted. They were, they yeah. couldn't believe it. You know, they couldn't believe it. The boy, well-educated and now is going in this breadless uh, fashion. And it, it is also, uh, uh, it is a problem, you know, uh, uh, to a living. I personally, uh, I'm very happy uh, to have no, no problems, uh, no outer problems. Uh, but I know many musicians who uh, don't know how to buy dinner. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Now, how, how do you see this uh, return of the vinyl form or the vinyl records? How do you value this? Why do you think people are so amazed, especially the newer generations? Uh, you know, uh, I, I grew up with vinyl and I'm a big, big fan of the format. Do you give us any special value to, to this format? Um, our records will come out in vinyl very soon again, all of them. Uh, and people say it's just a better sound. And when you, when you look into MP3 or MP4, it is different. And yeah. uh, record, you, you've got even the, the scratches. <laughs> I like the, the scratches. And all these uh, Spotify and, and co stuff, it is a different, uh, the, uh, the um, it's a different experience. It's a different it hearing is. experience. Um, uh, it's not what you have on digital. I personally also believe Digital is good for some things, but it's not good for all things. There's a digital wrong way going on because they want everything digital. And we see 
some of the young kids really suffer from wiping screens, you know, uh, and, and uh, deteriorating completely. It's, it's terrible. And I think uh, vinyl might be uh, a trend for them at the moment, but it's also the kick to be different. And I'm glad that it's there because there are people they don't want to go mainstream. And uh, in the beginning, that's a trick of the industry. You've got something and you've got to have it because the other one has it too. No, get something of your own. Go your own way, go a special way and then communicate. No greed, so, uh, no envy, but together. So I, 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 are their records going to be remastered? Uh, I, I suppose. Uh, are they going to be available outside Germany? What's the plan? Uh, definitely outside Germany, worldwide, definitely. It's a big company, it's a major company. They want to do it. Uh, uh, there are two major uh, companies, it's actually Sony and BMG, and mm. it's going to be either of the, uh, one of them. No. And no. I, also, yeah. I, got, uh, I got my own label now. How do you? Yeah, and there is a, uh, I've, uh, I'm going to have, uh, I've got three albums on it. One is from my trio called JHM. Just J H M, mm -hmm. John Michael Howell, John Howell Michael, um, and there is two albums. One is called Pure Spirit. The other one is called Wounded. Um, I could send you uh, um, MP3 uh, of it. Yeah, that would be good. So we can play the radio. Great, can play the radio. Yeah, I send yeah. you a mail and and hook it on the mail. I yeah. send it to audio. Yeah, and then well, I, can, I can share with Christian as well. You can. Yeah, well, that's what that's something. And then I've got uh, something else. It's called um, easel.com. Easel.com. Easel, easel means donkey. Um, in, in German language, easel.com. And it's a guy, it's just two guys. It's very underground. It's a bit um, like children's. Uh, children's songs, but always cheek in tongue. And where, when I'm saying you're not civilized, you're just industrialized, uh, this guy sings something and it's so nice and so non-revolutionary, but so on the point and he's explaining it without uh, insulting anybody or hurting anybody. And I, I put that in my, on my label, label as well. The label is called Klang Bureau. Bureau written in B U R E A U. B U R E A U. Bureau. Bureau. Klang. Klang is sound. Uh, Klang means sound. It's Klang Bureau, it's sound bureau. Um, I'm, I'm going to choose between two questions now. I uh, You mentioned a while ago. That you have been making uh, music for the movies, which is I'm a big, big fan of music for the movies. So is Claudio, and uh, in fact, I usually try to promote music from films uh, all the time. Every time I've been on radio, I've been I've done my shows. Now I'd like to know what type of films uh, have you been working in? In what area? Uh, actually, actually, yeah. for one of the musics, for one of the scores, uh, we received what you call the Oscar. Uh, the German Oscar, it's called Bundesfilmpreis. Nowadays it's called Lola. Uh, and I'm a member of the uh, Film Academy, of the German Academy. And we select uh, uh, who's getting the Lola every year. We do that in January, we do it again. Uh, I, I always have to watch 80 movies uh, to, to select. But we had in 71, uh, we had uh, this award, this uh, German uh, movie award uh, for a, a, a movie called San Domingo uh, of a guy called uh, Superberg, famous filmmaker. Superberg with a Y and Su. Superberg. Okay. And well, we made uh, we made music for Fassbinder. For Kluge, for every um, everybody, for Maria Schell, uh, for uh, Fight Relief, really, for everybody. We made so many um, yeah, right. music; it's amazing. 
Interesting. Uh -huh. Well, uh, I, I'm, I want to thank you for the time, John. It's really been oh, amazing. To, to... Sorry, sorry, by the way, I just yeah. released, I just uh, licensed a uh, green bubble raincoated man uh, to an American company. Who was it? Uh, they were called Thresher Magazine. Thresher Magazine. You know Thresher Magazine? No, but we need to check it out. Thresher Magazine, High Speed Productions, Underwood Avenue, San Francisco, California. Uh, contact Ashley McLean and they, uh, they uh, licensed them Green Bubble Raincoated Man for a, uh, no, Soap Shop Rock Burning Sister. Burning Sister for a skater movie, for a skater YouTube video or whatever. You made the music? No, it's a Green Bubble Raincoated Man. Okay. This is my music, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, no, no, it's a soap shop rock uh, on this one. Uh, last year I did Green Bubble Raincoated Man on another skater uh, YouTube movie. I don't know, the skaters obviously like <laughs> my music. Yeah, that, that must be a reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you were a skater in other life. I don't know. Yeah, but uh, I'm a skier. I couldn't. Uh, I've got ro uh, rollerblades. Uh, you see, that's why. Everybody thinks I'm crazy when I'm still going through the city with them. Uh, how? How? Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if you uh, mind about this question. I really have no idea how, how old you are. I can't imagine, but well, I'm a forty-nine. Yeah. Forty-nine, yeah, I, I, I imagine that, yeah. And well, how do you feel about it? Well, how do you feel about uh, time going on and on and on? Well, it's it feels like twenty-eight. Uh, uh, I feel <laughs> I haven't done anything in my life, and the big thing will st is still to come. Excellent. That's, That's the rock. spirit. Yeah. <laughs> That's rock, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you for the time. It's been an honor, a pleasure. My pleasure. My yeah, pleasure. please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your all your time. Uh, mm -hmm. That was an interview with John. And thank you very much again for your music, your patience with us. We've been going back and forth for three weeks already, so I'm very happy. And, and definitely, John, and, and Christian also for Christian. Christian is a, a he really, 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 really likes Popo Boo. So if we can do a follow up with uh, with if you can put Danny. us in touch with some of the Popol Boo members Danny, on the band yeah. or outside the band, every that we because there's only there's only Danny left, you know. Danny, Renate, yeah. Renate was singing on Popol Boo sometimes, our our singer. Yeah. And, and Danny, our drummer, was was doing most of the music for, and it was only Danny and Florian, you know. And, and Florian, Florian died. Yeah. In fact, when Florian died, we were at the funeral funeral, and we played. Uh, mo a song called Mozambique, a dual song called Mozambique. We never played this live, only on the funeral. And next yeah. day, uh, the Munich paper said, uh, from now on, you can make rock music uh, on a funeral. Amundur mm -hmm. has established that. <laughs> yeah. Were you good friends? Were you good friends with uh, Florian? Oh, yeah. I remember uh, when he bought his first MOOC, uh, he oh. invited everybody, the, all the musicians from Munich, uh, to his house, and uh, he presented this and played a little and all that. Wow. So, I was very lucky that here in Chile, the Goethe Institute uh, had a special festival uh, when I was in going to university, and they showed most of the Herzog movies, and I got fell in love with the music because it's really amazing. And that's my yeah. little story about it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Danny's a great musician, and when there, when there will be next album, it will be definitely Danny and me together on it. That's great. Yeah. Uh, thank you again for your time, uh, John. I will I will send uh, you the audio and the video. Very nice the records, and I will let you know uh, next week when we have the website up, so you can listen to the interview. We are going to be playing your music. Christian also in his race is going to be playing your music, and definitely we want to set up. If you can help us set an interview with Danny, it will be great and. We hope, we hope to see you here in Washington, D.C. next year. Oh, we'd love to be there. Yeah, and, and Christian wants to see you in Santiago. So, you know, <laughs> stay healthy, eat good food, read a lot of stuff, keep on producing music, and 
We'll see you very soon. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me. No uh, problem. Christmas. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. I hope you, you carry on doing a good job. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. again. Yeah. Have a Bye. good Bye, Christian. Bye.